Uh, greetings, everyone. I think we will uh, uh, begin tonight's uh, event. So greetings to all who are present here and anyone who is attending online. My name is Stratis Papayoanu. I'm a professor of Byzantine literature at the University of Crete and a member of the Yenadios Managing Committee. I stand here in the stead of Maria Yorgopoulou, the director of the Yenadios Library, who would normally be presenting this evening's speaker. Maria is on a Yenadios related field trip and arriving at any moment. <laughs> uh, with her apologies to you and our speaker, she asked me to fill in until she arrives. I think she will be able to fill in the questions at the end. Uh, and I'm glad, indeed, very happy to, to do so. For it is a great, great pleasure. <laughs> Hello, Maria. <laughs> uh, so I will, uh, I guess, continue. It is a great, great honor to welcome you all to Kotzen Hall's uh, Kotzen Hall for today's event that brings to the Yenadios Library the leading authority on Byzantine architecture in the world, a dear colleague, a model scholar, and a cherished friend, Robert Austerhout. Now, as soon as he learned that I may be presenting him, he emailed us a very, very short bio. I'm afraid I shall not do him the favor and be that short, but rather I will pester his humility with love and a slightly longer presentation. His good wit, I think, can endure this. Born in Oregon, where he also went to college in history of arts, uh, Professor Austerhout did his master's degree at Cincinnati and his PhD at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. After more than 20 years at the University of Illinois, where he also served as chairman of the Department of History of Architecture and Preservation of Monuments, Professor Austerhout taught since 2007 at the Department of History of Art at the University of Pennsylvania, where he is now Professor Emeritus. The number, but most importantly the depth, breadth and insight of his publications, not to mention his lectures, his curating and organizing of exhibitions, his field research and so on. So the number and the quality of all this is simply staggering. Let me concentrate uh, just on the books and from his near 40 books, authored, co-authored or edited, allow me to mention only some landmark studies that reflect his basic scholarly interests centered around Constantinople, the Holy Land, of course, Cappadocia, but also with an important detour in northern Greece. Let me begin with his most recent work, his breathtaking visualizing community, Art, Material, Culture and Settlement in Byzantine Cappadocia, published uh, at Dunbar Oaks uh, in 2017, and his equally breathtaking and masterly Eastern med medieval architecture, the building traditions of Byzantium and neighboring lands uh, which was published by Oxford University Press in 2019. Earlier books include The Architecture of the Kariya Jami in Istanbul, also published in Dabar Nox in 1987, and The Art of the Kariya Jami, published in 2002. The Byzantine Monuments of the Evros Meritz River uh, Valley, published in Thessaloniki together with Harlabos Bakidzis. Uh, his Master Builders of Byzantium, uh, published at Princeton uh, University Press 1999 and 2008, a must read. And of course, another earlier study on Cappadocia titled A Byzantine Settlement in Cappadocia, published in 2005, a work that taught us to rethink Cappadocia and its rock cut churches as domestic rather than monastic settings. Other earlier and path-breaking books are The Blessings of Pilgrimage, 1990, and The Sacred Image, East and West, with Leslie Brubaker, 1995, as well as his studies on the importance of the Church of the Holy Sepulchre as architectural model uh, also in Western European architecture. An attentive professor and mentor to his students, a wonderful guide on the field, a dedicated proponent of faithful restoration, Professor Osterhout uh, dedicated many years of his life also in the to the restoration of Byzantine monuments in Constantinople until political issues put an end to such campaigns. 
Since 2011, to mention another activity of his, he has co-directed the Cappadocia and Context Graduate Seminar, an international summer field school for Coach University, which is taking place also this uh, summer in person. Uh, while recently, to cite another side of the multifaceted Austerhout, he has published two collections of fiction, uh, Reluctant Stories and Indifferent Oracles, Random Objects. Now, the rhetoric of presenting speakers perhaps demands of one to use superlative phrases, but in this case, one can use them unapologetically. Here we have uh, with us a scholar who has shaped fundamentally the study of business and architectural history and, and history of art in ways that are visible both in his own work and in the work of his many students. He has essentially redefined our understanding of the architectural lingua franca of the Mediterranean world and taught us how to look at business buildings and objects at the crosswords of, e of both East and West from the perspective both of technology and the medieval conceptions and experiences of the sacred. It is no accident that he has received numerous awards, fellowships and grants, and most recently he was awarded the 2021 Haskins Medal by the Medieval Academy of America. His lecture today revisits the concept of the Helladic School of Byzantine Architecture and situates Byzantine architecture in Greece within a larger global concept. Please join me in welcoming Professor Austerhout at the podium. I thought he'd never end. <laughs> Thank you, Strati. That was really very um, embarrassing. And uh, let me begin by thanking First and foremost, I'm Mary Yogopoulou for the invitation to be here, as well as the institutional sponsorship of the Gennadius Library and the Getty Foundation. And I also really I, I'm, uh, feel like I'm bringing coals to Newcastle to talk about Byzantine architecture in Greece in Greece. Um, I think my Byzantine friends here like me because I don't work in Greece. <laughs> <laughs> but I have to have, say a special shout out to Michalis Kapas, who couldn't be with us today as he's recovering from COVID, but I've learned a great deal from him. And I have to say, he could have given the first half of the lecture. The second half of the lecture could have given, been given by um, Dimitris Athanasoulis, so I thank both of them for everything I've learned from them over the years, and many other friends as well. So um, without humiliating anyone else, since I've been humiliated already by Stratis, let me begin. So the architectural resurgence in Attica and the Peloponnese during the Middle Byzantine period, the 10th through 12th centuries, corresponds to a time of prosperity following the Byzantine defeat of the Arabs in 961 and the subsequent military interventions in the Balkans by Basil II, who celebrated a triumph in Athens in 1018. Hundreds of churches survive across the region more than uh, two dozen in Athens alone, many of them small and domed and distinctive in their architectural style. Gabriel Millet offered an important assessment of their, uh, uh, of their stylistic features and construction techniques in his dissertation, Les Corrects dans l'Architecture Byzantine, published in 1916, situating them in contrast to the churches of Constantinople. His terminology persists. L'école grecque is often translated today as the Greek school, or more commonly, the Helladic school. Um, by school, he meant something like a school of fish, um, which cluster together because of their similarities, rather than an educational institution. Thus, my own teacher, Slobodan Churchich, has termed this the Helladic paradigm. So whatever we call it, there is a remarkable consistency to the architecture 
And uh, of all regions of Byzantium, none is more recognizable and none has received more attention by architectural historians, although analyses rarely transgress national boundaries. Major planning types, such as the cross and square type or the domed octagon type, probably originated in and around Constantinople, but were introduced into Greece in the 10th and 11th centuries, with what may be the earliest examples of both types found at Hosius Lucas Monastery, the Panagia Church of the 10th century and the Catholicon of the early 11th both remarkably sophisticated buildings. And both building types that we see here, the cross and square church and the octagon dome church, appear shortly thereafter in Athens. Um, uh, we have uh, the 10th century uh, church at Moni Petraki, which has a number of distinctively Constantinopolitan features. And, um, a domed octagon of the early 11th century at the Panagia Lycodemo, um, which you see here. There are many varieties of both types in the Peloponnese, as for example, the domed octagon at uh, Hagia Sophia at Monombasia, or the many small cross and square churches of the Mani, the Taxiats at Glezu, Hagia Vavara at Erimos, uh, or I guess uh, Sergios Gavajos at Kita. The cross and square type in particular displays, displays great flexibility, often um, challenging uh, typological categorization. Within this group of monuments, um, there are few, least, few securely dated examples. Almost all those just mentioned are insecurely dated with their chronology determined by a combination of stylistic features and historical circumstances insofar as they can be reconstructed. Mie's uh, analysis of the architecture emphasized its taxonomy, and this approach has dominated the scholarship. Perhaps uh, most noteworthy in this context is the work of A.H.S. Megaw, known to his friends as Peter, um, whose work is indebted to Millet. In a paper published in the 1931-32 Annals of the British School of Archaeology, he attempts to refine the chronology of Middle Byzantine churches by concentrating on distinctive features within the construction materials and decorative details of the building, ranging from brick patterning uh, to window forms. A year later, McGaw published a similar analysis of the churches in the Mani Peninsula in the southern Peloponnese. For the most part, the chronologies of McGaw de um, uh, that McGaw developed have been supported um, by more, more, re uh, more recent scholars, uh, that is, until some fairly significant changes in more recent scholarship. The approach based on formal analysis has dominated Greek scholarship on Byzantine architecture to this day, notably that of Anastasios Orlandos. Perhaps its most important representative is uh, Haralambos Buras, whom I'm sure many of you know, who has quite literally written the book on Hellenic Byzantine architecture. But he was very much invested in the life of forms and with a close analysis of ornament. As a champion of the Greek school, he has argued for its originality, that is, emphasizing its innovative character while distancing its architectural production and dependence on Constantinople. A somewhat different approach uh, is, uh, was taken by Yorgos Philenis, who taught for many years at Aristotle University in Thessaloniki, whose studies shifted the discussion more toward the technical aspects of architectural practice, arguing that uh, what we often described as decorative details on buildings are, in fact, um, uh, the byproduct of construction techniques. In spite of their differences, both prioritize the close analysis of standing monuments. And as architectural, and, um, as architectural historians, archaeologists, or restorers, in Greece today, um, most scholars working in the field 
uh, were trained either by Boris or Volenis. And I have to add, many of the best scholars working on Byzantine architecture today are Greek, some in the audience today, so I feel a little bit like a provincial schoolmaster in their midst. Yes, here they are, my, my superstars of the Greek school. Uh, but more than typology, the Hellenic churches are distinguished by their external features, which include cloisonne masonry in the wall construction with each squared block of sandstone outlined in brick, often combined with dog-tooth friezes, that is, bricks set on the diagonal, um, as you see the bands in the detail. Um, and these are used both in horizontal bands and in window frames. Um, and in addition, we have the pseudo kufic brickwork, that is, brickwork which imitates or replicates Islamic script um, and seems to have been introduced into Greece at the Panagia Church at Hosius Lucas, and it appears commonly thereafter. Other forms of carved brick or um, decoration are employed. Um, by the early 11th century, glazed ceramic bowls or bacini um, uh, are introduced as decorative insets into the Greek churches. Carved marble detailing and the use of spolia are also common. Walls appear flat, decorated as flat decorated surfaces with little three-dimensional articulation. Windows tend to be small and few. And although they remained open to new features from near and far, the Hellenic masons exerted surprisingly little influence beyond the region. That said, the continuity of distinctive Hellenic features into the 13th century, when the region was taken over by the Franks, indicates the strength of a regional identity represented by the architectural vocabulary. So today, I'd like to take a look at several characteristic aspects of this architecture and ask um, if we might view these within a broader uh, geographical perspective. Medieval studies have recently undergone what has been called a global turn, emphasizing aspects of continuity across traditional frontiers. This is something that uh, Dr. Yorgo Pulu and I have emphasized in our own research and something we have developed with our colleague Scott Redford in workshops we have organized for the Getty Foundation. And I know some of our uh, students are in our midst today. Anyway, the question is, what can we learn by shifting our focus to situate the regional within the global? Does the evidence we might glean from a close analysis of individual buildings help us to understand larger issues of cultural exchange or political dynamics during the Byzantine period? And I should add, uh, emphasize that for many period, regions and periods of the Byzantine Empire, uh, written documentation is lacking. And we often are left with the visual and material culture as our best evidence for writing history. So let me begin with a few puzzling aspects of design that may indicate awareness of developments everywhere. Um, the Church of the Holy Apostles in the Athenian Agora is well known, but I find it particularly enigmatic. Built around the year 1000, it stands as an early representative of the architectural revival in Athens, and it picks up many of the decorative and constructional details seen at the Panagia at Hosius Lucas. That said, it has a unique plan, um, which has never been sufficiently explained. Um, although its central dome is supported above four columns, um, it's set within a circle rather than a square, um, measuring about eight meters in diameter, with apses projecting on the main axes and niches filling out the corners. Should we view this as a cross in circle plan, as a, simply a geometric based, geometrically based alternative to the cross in square? On the contrary, um, if we remove the columns from the plan, 
there they go. Um, um, the holy apostles confers favorably with um, Saint Ripsime at Vagar Shapat, or the Church of the Holy Apostles at Akhtamar, or a variety of other centrally planned Armenian churches. And I suggest that it might have been designed originally as an octagon dome church, dependent on a Caucasian model, and subsequently modified with a smaller dome. So let's put the columns back in, and let's go inside where it really does look like typical Byzantine church interior of this region, small dome above four columns. Whatever its inspiration, it stands as a unique building with no successors. A second example is um, the Akapnikerea in Athens, which has a porticoed exonarthex added probably in the early 12th century. While a following the now's construction details, the unique gabled roof line and protecting porch, a projecting porch seemed curiously Caucasian, comparable to the 10th century uh, portico and porch of the Church of John the Baptist at Ashki in the Tauklerjeti region. And I stop to point out that that woman in white in the middle there is none other than Maria Yogopoulou. <laughs> on, we had a, a fabulous trip through this region many years ago. Uh, how such plans and details um, might have migrated from afar is unclear, particularly in a period when architecture was, in effect, an illiterate um, profession, and architectural drawing, use of architectural drawings was limited at best. For the holy apostles, at least, Constantinople may have been an intermediary. Um, the Kamariotisa church on the island of Halki in the Prince's Islands just outside of Constantinople indicates the uh, adoption of the Armenian building types in the capital in this period as well. Um, like the Holy Apostles in Athens, the Kamariotisa was built by local masons, although the design was likely imported. The origin of the Kapnikarya's distinctive uh, features is less clear, as perhaps it's best to view these buildings as indicative of the Helladic builder's ability to assimilate and combine architectural elements from a variety of disparate sources. And they raise a provocative question. Should we continue to view Constantinople as a clearinghouse for architectural ideas, or is it possible for features such as these to have bypassed Constantinople in their transmission. Another concern that has uh, interested me in this architecture is the use of natural light. And for this, I turn to the Catholicon of Hosius Lucas. Um, its sophistication presents one of the great mysteries of Byzantine Greece. There is no indication of hesitancy or experimentation in either its design or its execution. All details are carefully coordinated, and yet there's nothing even vaguely comparable to um, the Catholicon in earlier architecture of Greece. With a dome of about uh, eight and a half meters in diameter, the Catholicon is also out of scale with local production. Who were its patrons? Where did its design come from? its builders, its mosaicists and painters, its materials, even its foundation goes unrecorded. While hotly debated, it seems most likely that the design came from Constantinople and possibly patronage as well. It, perhaps the imperial presence of Basil II in 1018 could have something to do with it. Indeed, this is a time when the connections with the imperial capital were the closest the popularity of the tomb of the Blessed Luke as a pilgrimage destination could also have encouraged wide-ranging financial support for the project, curiously undocumented for an undertaking of this magnitude. The project is likely overseen by a Constantinopolitan master, although the construction of large stone blocks is uh, 
uh, mixed with brick, finds no comparison in the capital. Even for local construction, the use of materials is unusual, but the preponderance of large stone may be attributed to structural considerations. For the skeletal nature of its structural system is critical to the design of the building. Throughout the spaces enveloped by the dome, um, the structural system employs groin vaults, which adjust the weight to uh, the four corners of each bay, eliminating the necessity of bearing walls. And by shifting to a system of point support, much, of the architect, much as the architects of Hagia Sophia had done in Constantinople, thick bearing walls could be reduced or even eliminated. Natural lighting dramatically enhances the impression of the interior as it shimmers across surfaces of mosaic and marble. The openness and daring, uh, structural daring, stand very much in contrast to the Helladic churches of similar design. The Sotera Nicodemu in Athens, built shortly um, after Hosius Lucas and thought to be a three-quarter scale copy of it, is missing both the structural sophistication and the degree of openness, with an emphasis on the decorated mural surface. The Catholicon of Daphne, built around 1080, is lavishly outfitted with, was lavishly outfitted with marbles and mosaics, but it also lacks the open design, with smaller and fewer windows. If we simply compare the number and size of windows, um, the difference is striking. Big windows at Hosius Lucas, small windows at Daphne. Now, the same lack of openness is evident in cross and square churches as well. The um, Hagia Moni in Aria outside Nauplion, um, dated by inscription to 1149, uh, is exceptionally well constructed with a similar emphasis, emphasis on the flat wall uh, surfaces. The wall construction is impressive. Um, above the foundation, uh, it is almost entirely uninterrupted of courses of cloisonne, with large reused blocks of stone form, forming crosses that mark the width of the cross arms and correspond to pilasters on the interior. At the same time, the windows are few and thin. On the cross arms, as you see here, they are flanked by half arches filled with brick patterning. This is contrast sharply with um, Constantinopolitan windows. You see there the half arches I'm uh, pointing out. But if we compare this with something like the Cosmos of Tira at Ferre, built by masons from Constantinople for the Prince Isaac Komnenos. Um, you can see huge windows in the cross arms that fill the interior with light, um, filling out the, the arch of the lunette, um, whereas in uh, Hagia Moni, we see only a small portion of that central area is given over to windows. Oh, sorry. Yes, and um, in earlier Constantinopolitan examples, as at the Miralan, seen here in a reconstruction on the left, um, the lunette was often left completely open, closed only by mullions, and uh, with an opened arcade down below very much in contrast to the solid wall construction at Hagia Moni. Other churches in the Peloponnese are more extreme. The church of Hagia Theodori at Wambaka, um, dated um, by inscription to 10, seven, uh, 1075, it's a simple two-column church um, with a narthex. But the relative darkness of the interior is noteworthy. The window openings are filled with carved marble transenni, each containing only a single small round opening, um, while 
the dome alternates flat surfaces and pseudo windows on the exterior with none opening into the interior. The church of uh, Agia Varvara at Eremos, probably from the third quarter of the 12th century, is similar. Um, many of the windows um, are closed um, uh, with um, single, uh, with a small oculus. And Agios Petros in Castagna, uh, the exterior features false windows the openings filled by blind, blind transenni, as you see on the left, with no opening um, uh, set within the marble transenna. Um, and by the way, that is Michaelis Kappas on the far right of the far right slide. Here a view of the interior. Um, openings, uh, let's see, um, leaving uh, the closing off of the windows leaves the interior uh, unbroken mural surfaces for painted decoration. But in the words uh, of the immortal Leonard Cohen, you want it darker? <laughs> and here in the interior of Hagia Moni. Now, in addition to the loss of natural illumination, we lose a sense of transparency characteristic of Middle Byzantine Constantinople, where the exterior articulation is reflected on the interior spatial and structural divisions. Moreover, as it appears in Constantinople, the cross and square church type seems to have been designed for natural daylight, in, with natural daylight in mind, uh, with light entering the building at several different levels accentuating the spatial volumes of the interior. But natural light does not seem to have been a concern um, in the uh, Greek churches. Many services would have taken place at, uh, during the nighttime, and the lighting of lamps and candles was understood as an act of devotion. So one wonders how this might have affected the meaning of the building. Um, have the intellectual, abstract, neoplatonic associations with natural light, um, um, associated of natural light with spiritual illumination uh, in the learned circles of Constantinople, have these been replaced by a more concrete framework for the active engagement in devotion? That is, natural light being replaced by artificial light. And with the emphasis inside and out on the unbroken mural surface, has the idea of the church as an image of heaven been transformed into something more akin to a mighty fortress? In short, the above, above ample uh, examples point toward a selective appropriation of forms from elsewhere, which were modified and adapted as they were incorporated into regional use and regional worship practices. Let me now turn to the decorative aspects of architecture. Ornament is a distinctive feature in the, uh, of the exterior, exterior articulation. One of the critical questions in the scholarship is how we should interpret it. Does ornament function as a semiotic agent, a signifier? And this is, in this respect, Pseudokufic decoration is one of the most frequently discussed aspects of Hellenic architecture, um, although there is little consensus as to how it should be read. In Greece, it makes its first appearance in the, uh, appearance in the bricked ornament of the exterior of the Panagia Church at Hosius Lukas, where it's used in brick courses as decorative emblems and friezes, as well as um, patterning on the marble cornices. Sometimes the, singular, uh, the single word Allah um, may be discerned. Sometimes the phrase al-mukallillah, or sovereignty belongs to God. But whether we understand it as writing or pseudo-writing, its particular meaning would have remained unintelligible to a regional audience who would not have known Arabic. 
Now, several reasons uh, for its introduction have been proposed, and I defer here to um, the uh, work of my colleague, uh, Alicia Walker, who proposes two potential, if not mutually exclusive, readings, both, however, assuming that the writing was understood as Arabic. Um, it might represent a triumphal appropriation of Islamic imagery related to the Blessed Luke's prediction of the Byzantine defeat of the Arabs. It may also refer to the language of the Church of the East, positioning Hosius Lucas within a global context of pilgrimage by associating it with its Holy Land counterparts. My own preference is to see pseudo-Kufic as magical writing, that is, indecipherable characters with apotropaic power as found on Byzantine amulets, sometimes called voces magicae. These were untranslatable words that appear in ancient Greek magical papyri or on cursed tablets, a divine language understood by supernatural beings. They've also been read as the secret names of the gods, perhaps their foreign names. In ancient magic, foreign languages were thought to be more powerful or efficacious than the local tongue, if Allah, the foreign name of God, is to be read in the pseudo-Kufic, then perhaps the use of pseudo-Kufic was simply conforming to long-established magical practices. Now, if understood as magical or apotropaic, it would thus have a similar valence to the um, um, crosses, stars, and Christogams and other symbols that appear in the brick decoration of churches in northern Greece, as here at Castoria. Intriguing, intriguingly, although many of the decorative elements of the Helladic paradigm were retained into the Frankish-controlled 13th century, pseudo-Kufic is rare after that time, but occasionally we find indecipherable brick letters decorating the exteriors of churches as on the north facade of the 13th century church at Gastuni. And if anyone can tell me how to read these letters, I will be very happy to listen. As undecipherable sacred script, pseudo-Kufic could provide a sense of holiness um, as miraculous signs to fortify sacred space. And I wonder if there might be an underlying confusion of Arabic and Hebrew, uh, Hebrew, the language of the Bible, which might be more appropriate in many contexts. On the exterior of a church, for example, the language of Islam might be read as apotropaic, like a gorgon's head, um, evil to ward off evil. Um, but if this were the case, it would be, seem uh, less appropriate on the church's interior. So two examples here emphasize its use as a marker of sanctity. In uh, better understood as a language of the Bible, First, in Hosius Lucas, um, the mosaic of the presentation of the temple, the ciborium that represents the temple is here decorated with pseudo-Kufic, and um, Alicia Walker has discussed this as a sign of linguistic and cultural otherness. Should this be read as Arabic to associate uh, the temple with the Dome of the Rock, the Muslim uh, incarnation of the temple, or is it the language of the Old Testament temple? The second example is at Daphne, um, where pseudo-Kufic appears infrequently on the exterior, but on the interior, the Naus cornice is decorated with a Champlevé Rasso frieze, um, which you see to the right of the red arrow. Um, but as the frieze turns into uh, the bima, the decorative pattern changes to pseudo-Kufic, that is, to the left side of the arrow. Again, this suggests a sacred meaning to the script. Um, why else would you use this script in um, the bima, the most holy area of the church? But if the bima is to be associated with the Holy of Holies of the temple, 
then a Hebrew reading might make more sense. Despite the obvious visual differences between uh, Kufic and Hebrew characters, their shared valence as sacred script should not rule out this possibility. Um, the almost complete absence of pseudo-Kufic in the Latin-sponsored churches of the 13th century suggests that it had a meaning to its Byzantine audience that was not fully understood by the Latins. But the ubiquity of pseudo-Kufic in Hellenic architecture may mean um, that more than one reading is possible, as Walker has suggested. Richard Krautheimer once wisely remarked in a similar context, the ties between form and significance, indissolvable as they are at the beginning of the development, become tenuous at the end. In any case, pseudo-Kufic appears so commonly in Hellenic architecture of the Middle Byzantine period but it, that it may be nothing more potent than ornament with amuletic associations, that is, as it was absorbed into the visual language of Hellenic architecture, it lost its specificity. Um, a second common uh, decorative element are the glazed ceramic bowls or bacini, which appear immured in the walls of Greek churches after the uh, early 11th century. Now, bacini are known in the, uh, here, um, in a variety of Greek churches, and did I skip a slide here? I think I did. No, well, uh, sorry. Uh, you see them in a variety of Greek churches, um, uh, in arcades, around windows, and those at the Agia Moni, as you see here, may have come from uh, Fatima in Egypt. Others are local or regional production, those at uh, Eremos, uh, for example, may have been produced in Athens or Corinth. Now, are these to be read as geographical signifiers, markers of alterity? Would Fatiman bowls have had a valence of otherness, similar to that suggested by Pseudo-Kufic? And is their meaning similar to that of their Itali Italian counterparts? Now, in uh, Pisa and in areas of Western Europe, Bacini are known from the late 10th century onward, and these may have inspired their use in the Greek churches. But in the parallel monuments of Italy, the Bacini seem to have been second-rate decoration, with roundels of colored marble preferred. So their decorative role seems to be most important. They're shiny, they're colorful, they call attention to the exterior. Moreover, as glazed ceramics began to be produced locally in Pisa, the use of imported wares um, as architectural decoration was sharply curtailed. Similarly, in the Greek examples, their use seems to be primarily decorative. If a meaning is to be associated with them, it is perhaps as signifiers of sacred presence, as miraculous signs of protection. That is, similar to something like um, the burnished discs that appear on some uh, Sinai icons, or the so-called whirling discs that appear in Byzantine painting, in Serbian painting like that above the head of the uh, Virgin in the church at Patch. Now, the uh, practice of immuring ceramic bowls continues into the Latin-occupied 13th century Peloponnese and perhaps reached its peak um, late in the century, as at the Church of the Dormition of Merbaca, which included more than 50 bowls in its facade, often proto maiolica of southern Italian origin. There's still much to be learned from the Bacini. For example, the recent redating of the Church at Merbaca and the Church of Gastuni, to which I'll re return, um, have uh, caused a long standing. Uh, have, have caused the long-standing chronology proposed by Magua to be mis uh, dismantled, and it's still being understood. There's still a lot of work to be done uh, with the Bacini, and I um, welcome the ongoing study of Anastasia Yangaki in this. 
A few words on the monuments of the 13th century Peloponnese are in order, as many of the features I've just discussed continue to appear. Following the conquest of 1205 by William of Champlit and Geoffrey of Villehardouin, Andravida or was established as a capital with a castle nearby at Clumuzzi, uh, a luxurious French-style fortified residence. And more than half a century later, a port was established at Glorenza. While this triangle of power, as uh, Dimitri Satanasoulis has termed it, in the northwest Peloponnese may have been exclusively Western in its architecture and population, the cultural developments of the period would not without support of the Greek um, archons who were quickly integrated into the Western feudal system. Indeed, while the urban centers were primarily administered by the Latins, the countryside remained primarily Greek. And the cultural mix, as it is expressed in the architecture, mer merits further exploration. Byzantine masons participated in Frankish construction projects. Moreover, they incorporated signature features and Frankish architecture into their own. Um, recent scholarship has emphasized the remarkable degree of inter-ethnic assimilation, coupled with a regional identity that came to be shared by both the Latins and the Greeks. Um, there were um, the Vilhardwans who ruled the territory, learned to speak Greek. There were a variety of Greeks who spoke French. And there were intermarriages on all social levels. As Joel Page has emphasized, based on a close reading of the various manuscript texts of the Chronicle of Morea, the constructed other of the formal histories was more powerful in promoting an ethnic sense of Roman, that is, Byzantine identity in the elite circles of Constantinople um, than was uh, the actual presence of the other, in the Peloponnese at least. On the borders of the Byzantine Roman world, boundaries were more nebulous and negotiable than in the more ideologically driven center. The pragmatism of a frontier zone, unlike Constantinople, had less um, of the ideology of Byzantine superiority and consequent automatic disparagement of foreigners. And the idea of um, imperial rule and Byzantine political allegiance was not a strong part of a regional identity. With a um, pattern of transgression of boundaries in the Peloponnese, ethnic identity was more negotiable. Language barriers were crossed Orthodox and Catholics attended services in each other's churches. Byzantines became um, feudatories in the Frankish system. Moreover, they intermarried and their children, in effect, could choose an ethnic identity. Both groups felt a localized identity um, by, that by the end of the century, in the shifting political sense, stood in opposition both to um, the Angevins and the, constant, uh, and the rule of Constantinople. The arrival of the Franks in 1204 appears something, um, after 1204, appears as something of an intrusion into the architectural developments, reflecting the dynamic changes in the architecture of Western Europe during the preceding century. The large, longitudinally planned churches of the Latins stand in, small con uh, uh, in contrast to the small, self-contained monuments of the Byzantine. Antoine Bonne, uh, in his um, important study, Le Moré Franc uh, of 1969, divided the churches into two categories, Western or Byzantine. Um, those of his Western examples were all large churches of the monastic orders, such as Hagia Sophia at Andravida, built by the Dominicans, or at which doubled as an audience hall for Geoffrey of Villardouin, as well as a court chapel and cathedral. The Church of um, St. Francis at Glorenza, which Athanasulis dates to the 1260s, was similar in form and function. It was monastic, uh, associated with the Franciscan, but served both for public assembly and lay worship. Um, Bond's analysis assumed that nothing was built by the Orthodox population until the Byzantine conquest began toward the end of the century. Haralambos Buras 
repeated Bond's basic subdivision of Frankish versus Byzantine in his 2001 book chapter on the impact of Frankish architecture on Byzantine architecture. In the second category, however, he lists nine Byzantine churches in the Peloponnese exhibit, exhibiting Western features, however, and dated these to the 13th century. Um, following the studies on the 13th century Byzantine inscriptions uh, by Sofia Calopisi Verti, he suggests that many uh, Orthodox of, uh, of all social groups took advantage of the religious tolerance and relative prosperity of the 13th century to build churches. He nevertheless concludes that the gap between the two religious dogmas was never bridged either by the Greeks or the population at large. That is, the two groups remained distinct in their religious and ethnic identity. Nevertheless, Bura's study represented a, uh, a sea change in Greek scholarship that we can attribute to several factors. One is the recent ongoing a uh, serious archaeological study of the Frankish monuments by Greek scholars, notably on uh, Dimitri Sothenosoulis. Another factor has been the refinement of the pottery chronology, both for locally produced wares and imported wares, based on long-term analysis at the excavations at Corinth. The reexamination uh, re of imported pottery in previously excavated closed deposits in conjunction with recent Italian studies on the beginning of the production of certain types of glazed uh, wares, allowed Theo, the late Theo Mackay and subsequently uh, Guy Sanders to redate some critical wares. Based on this, both Sanders and Mary Lee Coulson have considered the ceramic evidence in relationship to, of, uh, to the use of imported bowls in the decoration of churches. The critical monument uh, for this discussion is the Church of the Dormition of the Virgin at Merbaka, already noted, which Megos chronology had placed in the late, in the 12th century. In addition to some Gothic features, colonnades, capitals, and so on, it preserves um, 22 of its original 53 immured bowls, which are part of the initial, original decorative program while these are frequent features in the Greek school churches, of the bowls at Meribaka, nine are of uh, proto uh from the general area of Brindisi, of a type not produced in Italy before the beginning of the 13th century, and there's no evidence for its introduction into Greece before the middle of the 13th century. Other types of ceramics used in the building have similar chronological parameters. To shorten a long argument, they could not have been produced before the last quarter of the 13th century. Similarly, the type of Venetian pottery immured in Merbaka does not appear to have been imported after the early 14th century. With this new date, it is tempting to associate the church um, at Merbaka with a distinguished translator, William of Merbeek who became Archbishop Bishop of Corinth in 10, uh, 1277. The selection of ancient spolia used in abundance at the church is reflecting the preoccupation of William. And Colson suggested that the unusual crypt beneath the sanctuary may have been intended as uh, for the burial of William, who died in 1286. She also noted that there's no evidence for the mounting of a Templon screen in the interior which would be necessary for Orthodox worship, suggesting that the Byzantine-style church was built by, for Frankish use. Um, the recent re-examination of the church at uh, uh, the Panagia uh, Catholici at uh, Gastuni is uh, also significant. Mogol had dated it to the 12th century, but it is decorated with similar proto maiolica similar to that at Meribaka. Here you see an example of the gridiron proto um, The dedicatory inscription has been uncovered, uh, recording that it was a private foundation of the Caligopolis clan in the year 1278-79, uh, among whose brothers uh, the oldest was named William. 
And Athanasuli has associated them with a local family of archons, or wealthy landowners, who prospered under the Vilhard lands. With the unusual name suggestion uh, uh, resulting from either prestige bias or intermarriage. And there's even a suggestion that perhaps the Caligopoli had converted to Catholicism. All told, perhaps it would make more sense to see the architecture of the Frankish period as reflecting the social status of the founder or the purpose of the foundation rather than as a marker of ethnicity. Byzantine style churches surely represent private foundations for either Catholic or Orthodox patrons. Indeed, it's a private level that uh, cultural overlap becomes most evident. For example, in his study of burial practices, Eric Iveson has noted some crossover between confessions. Byzantines occasionally follow the Western practice of including bowls as grave goods. In the culturally sensitive area of personal belief for which burial, burial is the final expression, differences in faith um, did not prevent interchange. One final example is um, the Church of St. Nicholas at uh, Apia in Messenia. Uh, Messenia is a small cross-vaulted Byzantine-style church of a type associated with the 13th century. It was augmented in a second phase of construction by a Gothic style porch and um, the addition you see here, which has a number of Gothic style details. Um, the, uh, uh, in the burial chapel. Um, but uh, we can also see uh, the um, use of pointed arches and um, slender and gauge colonnettes at the corner. Um, the church was conserved in um, uh, 2011, and I thank uh, Michalis Kapas for sharing his results with me. At that time, um, an excavation inside the chapel revealed two burials, a masonry-lined cis grave which contained a looted male burial, the only finding from which was an elaborate buckle uh, uh, from the belt of the dead. The investigation of the site indicated with certainty, the chapel was built after the construction of the tomb, um, but certainly to include the burial. Next to him was a modest female burial, probably inserted just a few years later, um, because, and because it was placed in close relationship, probably um, with kinship ties between the two. But who were these people? Were they Latins or Greek? The excavators suggested they were Latin, but I like to think they could be either. At Merbaca, we may have had Latins choosing to build a church in a Byzantine style, while at Apia, uh, we could have had local Greeks choosing to be buried in a chapel of Frankish style. But by the end of the 13th century, are these labels still valid in the multi-ethnic context of the Peloponnese? In the above discussion, I've singled out various aspects of design and decoration that might be taken as emblems of alterity. In every case, however, rather than referring to somewhere else or deriving meaning from an exotic other, these elements seem to have been fully absorbed into Helladic architecture. More often than not, I suspect, alterity may be in the mind of the art historian. Um, if the plans, external forms, or decorative details originally had a meaning that transcended regional boundaries, that was quickly replaced by a locally understood one. While expanding a visual vocabulary of an architecture that valued variety, these were elements um, that were meant to speak regionally. In this respect, notions of sacred presence or of apotropaic magic would make far more sense than reminiscences of distant locales. That said, it may be possible to effectively map the accumulated architectural detail onto trade routes as commodities, items of value, prestige, and delight, physical manifestations of commercial and cultural exchanges in a globalized Mediterranean world. In the end, however, 
they become part of the visual language of a regional architecture with a regional identity that resonated with a regional audience. As we move into the 13th century, however, when the region is under Frankish control, we might detect a slight change. A variety of Western European details were assimilated into the architectural vocabulary at that time. Pointed arches, traceries, sculptural elements, and imported ceramics. But rather than representing an exotic other, or simply remaining ideologically neutral, I suspect, I suspect these features were in fact markers of alterity, but of a familiar other, uh, which would have had a particular resonance to a Frankish or Frankish-controlled audience. Um, thank you for your attention and patience. an enlightening uh, lecture uh, that, as usual, pulls together uh, material uh, that some of us know. I mean, we're all familiar with some parts of it, I'm sure. Uh, but uh, the, the fact that you look at uh, the, the material itself uh, so deeply and in such a thoughtful way it uh, really makes us understand uh, how, how you want to pull it together uh, in, in this uh, uh, very, very interesting manner uh, that makes us uh, think uh, beyond uh, the, the traditional boundaries uh, that, that we know. Um, I, um, uh, the, if, if there are questions from uh, the audience online, I would uh, ask that uh, uh, you put them uh, in uh, the Q&A. It's uh, easier for us to get uh, uh, through uh, most of them. Uh, but uh, I, I'm wondering if there are any questions from uh, the audience here in Cotton Hall. I'm waiting for my great colleagues to start throwing tomatoes at me. <laughs> uh, Liliana, there in the middle. Thank you very much, Professor Esterhout, for this fascinating lecture. Um, I was thinking, and this for a long time, about these crosses that we see uh, on the outer walls of Osios Lucas and the church of Hagia Muni that you showed in Aria. So I was wondering, what are your thoughts about this element? Is it purely decorative? Um, where do we find it? What are its origins? Sorry, what, what element are you talking about? The, uh, the, the crosses that we oh, see the crosses. on the yeah, sides, yeah. yes. Um, well, it's, it's sort of fascinating to see them because where they, the crosses are included on the facade of Hagia Muni corresponds exactly to the structural divisions of the building. So they are using large blocks of stone as part of the stabilizing of the building, but I suppose we could also take the next step and say that they are spiritually stabilizing the building as well with crosses at the significant points in the walls. Um, so I think maybe they're, you know, in Hagia uh, Muni, they're doing double duty. But as we see in so many examples of uh, the Greek churches of this period, they're using uh, large spoliated blocks of stone as strengthening elements at the corners and at critical points in the construction. Thank you. So do you think that we can maybe think about different workshops that would use that element as a sort of a signature, or it, that would be too far to, as an interpretation? Yeah, I think um, I don't know of anything like this in other parts of the Byzantine world. This seems to be something that we find in the Greek churches, but um, not uh, elsewhere. So I think this is something that perhaps we can associate with workshop practices that they know the structural role of this type of construction, but also they're thinking in terms of these elements as, as signifiers. Thank you very much. Um, 
We have a couple of questions that would like some more information on pseudo Kufic. And you know, Bob, from uh, our, our travels, uh, that uh, this is a very exciting topic, especially for people who haven't looked at these buildings maybe as carefully as you have. So can you say something more about it? Um, well, as we said in our, uh, our workshop together, we're goofy for Kufic. <laughs> um, Yes, I think it's, it's something that it is so distinctive, and we see it in other media elsewhere, but we don't see it in architecture outside of this particular group in Greece, where we see it so frequently. Um, it's something we don't see, for example, in the architecture of Constantinople. So it's something that has a particular meaning, a particular resonance with the Greek audience in the 11th and 12th centuries. Um, and the bottom line in my book, I suppose, is it's, it's pretty. It's pretty <laughs> decoration. Um, we like to ha use, uh, have aesthetic solutions um, to our buildings. But it's also elements that can have meaning. This doesn't mean that it does have meaning in all instances. Um, in early examples like Hosius Lucas, uh, the uh, Panagia church at Hosius Lucas, Lucas, it may have a very special meaning associated with the foundation there and with the prediction of the blessed Luke. That doesn't mean it's going to have that same meaning at every site where it appears. And scholars of uh, um, Islamic architecture, such as our our colleague Scott Redford has been very interested in this and has emphasized the fact that while we call it pseudo Kufic, it is in fact from someone who knows the Kufic style of Arab writing, which is a very stylized uh, style of writing. Um, it is legible. So uh, we can see regularly that the name of God, Allah, appears, or this um, phrase, blessings beyond to God, appears. It's never a long sentence, but sort of short fragments that in Arabic would have a meaning. Um, in looking at it, my, uh, my sense is writing means something if you can read it. It might mean something else if you can't read it. And the majority of the audience in um, the Peloponnese or in Athens or in Attica, they wouldn't have known um, Arabic. They may have been able to determine that this is Arabic writing, but uh, they really wouldn't have been able to take it much further than that. Um, so it may have, I like to think, apotropaic powers of warding off evil, or these associations with sanctity that I talk about. But it's something that uh, communicates as a sort of general sign rather than one that has great specificity. No one is reading, uh, well, let's say very few people are able to read Arabic in Greece in this period. So there would be a very limited audience to, who could actually look at the walls and say, aha, that says Allah. Um, so we have to, I think, take it out of that context of uh, legibility and specificity, and think in terms of kind of more general meanings that may be associated with the use of this. And I think what happens is, while there may be specific meanings at the time of its introductions, introduction, these gradually become, as it's assimilated into the architecture of the region, they become more generalized. They become sort of part and parcel of wall decoration. You know. When you build a wall, this is something you put in as a decorative element or maybe uh, a protective element in the wall. Yeah, well, my question Can you wait for the microphone? I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Hello. Oh, yeah. uh, my question relates to this last slide you're projecting <laughs> because I can very clearly read on it the end. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so if this is original, <laughs> not no, make up. No, it's, it's my manipulation just to keep it's you amused at the right. end of my okay. talk. <laughs> <laughs> so, if British doesn't make much sense. <laughs> I mean, if it was Italian, French or something, yeah. But British, <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. 
<laughs> yeah, I was going to spell it out in, in uh, Arabic, but I didn't know how. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Well, thank you very much for this brilliant lecture. Uh, just a, a comment on the uh, Kufik again. Uh, I think that your preferred reading of them as magic, magical characters is, is, is indeed very, um, very persuasive because at the same time, uh, it fits well with the extensive use of Kufik and pseudo-Kufik letters on jewelry. And jewelry always has an apotropaic prophylactic character, mm -hmm. not just decorative. So I think that this reading is truly very, very, um, you know, um, it, it makes sense to me. So, yeah, thank you. <laughs> well, thank you for that. Uh, I did an exhibit with my students several years ago on magic in the ancient world, and we had uh, just a fascinating collection of cursed tablets um, and these uh, magical amulets um, that were really fun uh, to study. And this sort of got me thinking about, you know, why would you have something as personal adornment like that that has signs on it that you can't read? And then I was thinking about, you know, these young people who get tattoos in foreign languages that <laughs> they don't know. And poor Britney Spears got a tattoo of Chinese characters that was um, done wrong, so it didn't even say anything legible in it. So there is this sort of notion that foreign languages or symbols uh, of letters of foreign languages um, can have it's a sort of um, certain kind of magical valence that you know they protect your body um, as jewelry, as ornament, or whatever, as they protect the buildings. So thank you. I have two questions uh, online that are slightly big questions. <laughs> a first one, a naive question, who were the designers builders and what dictated the various styles we see? <laughs> okay. Um, if you want to answer okay, in maybe, some form. Maybe read my book. <laughs> <laughs> no, I just very quickly, um, what we see is um, a distinctive change in architectural production from late antiquity into the Middle Byzantine period that the idea of the architect as designer who's doing something original as in Hagia Sophia or something like this really goes away and even the term architect is no longer used. Those who were in charge of building are called ecodomos, builders or house builders. Um, and rather than being design-driven, architecture in the period we're talking about is practice-driven. That is, you didn't go to the university to learn architecture. You worked with a workshop, and you learned how to do things their way. So you learned certain types of wall construction. You learned certain types of structural systems. You learned for example, special things like putting big stone crosses in the walls of um, buildings or putting um, pseudocufic decoration in the walls of buildings. All of this is something that is learned within the context of a workshop. That is, um, big ideas are not going to be transferred with architectural drawings or anything similar to how we think of architecture today. In fact, our evidence for the use of architectural drawings are very limited in this period. Um, may be used simply to coordinate details, not to design a building. These churches I've been talking about on the Greek school are usually very simple in their design, something that can be repeated easily um, from what you learn working on another building. And someone with a more sophisticated eye and far more time than I have could probably sit down with some of these buildings and identify um, very specific characteristics of individual workshops and sort of begin to see uh, the development of a you know, sort of genealogy of buildings within this school. But the point is that all of this is uh, something that is transmitted uh, within uh, a workshop. That is, architecture is learned on site by doing it. 
by building. About the interior lighting and the reduction of the openings, could we discuss about a, a monastery monasticization, monasticization of the church architecture and another perspective uh, over the interior? Yeah, I think, I, I, I think we could. I think that there's a change in spirituality. And when you, you know, people who write about light are always fascinated with the use of natural light, how natural light appears in the building, how it's used, and so on. And you get to these churches in Greece, with the exception of the Catholicon, at Hosius Lucas, um, there is limited use of natural light. And I wonder if, uh, as I suggested, that the idea of light as uh, suggesting a spiritual presence, as you see expressed in Neoplatonic philosophy, and we know, for example, that Anthemius and Isidorus, the architects of Hagia Sophia, were um, part of the Neoplatonic movement there. They might not have even been Christians, but they were thoroughly steeped in Neoplatonic thought and were designing a building that would resonate against that kind of thought with natural light as a potent symbol in the interior design. When you get to uh, Middle Byzantine Greece with these buildings with small windows, you know, I think in many, many ways, they could have had windows if they wanted to, and yet they chose not to. So this is a matter of choice. It's uh, not that they didn't know how to put windows in the buildings. The windows um, that we see, small and limited, mean that there's more attention paid to the use of artificial light. Um, that is, lighting of candles, lighting of lamps, and so on, is an act of devotion as it is today. When you go into church, you pay your um, um, 50 centime and get a candle, and you light the candle as a sort of physical manifestation of the prayers you're saying or your, you know, your, um, whatever you're doing spiritually in the interior of the building. Um, what's happening in your mind is physically manifest with the candle that you light. And when we look at the monastic documents of this period, um, one of the things that they're specific about is where and when candles and lamps are lit within the church. Where are they going to burn all the time? Where are they lit for special occasions? And it seems that light here has taken on a very different meaning, that you provide light in the interior of a building as an act of devotion. So I see this as kind of two different attitudes toward light. There's a sort of intellectualizing of natural light, but in the world that we're talking about in Middle Byzantine Greece, it's more light is provided by you, the worshiper, as an act of devotion. Does that make sense? Yes. Uh, here in front. Stephanos Gerulanos, I would like to ask, couldn't it be that it is a security and there are uh, churches that are not in city walls that have no windows and in a monastery like uh, Osios Lucas that uh, it is protected so you are not afraid of somebody throwing you fire in or... Uh, uh, um, there is little to burn in um, many of these churches. That Little wood is used in the construction. In the churches of the Mani, for example, they're using marble for the beams in the building rather than wood. No, I don't mean uh, then burning the, uh, the church, but uh, uh, fighting against so that they have only one or two entrances to protect if somebody uh, wants at the time of the, uh, the church to uh, to come in. Uh -huh. It could be. Many of these churches, the little churches that we talk about in this group, are um, uh, outside of the villages and they are funerary churches, so they wouldn't be used on a regular basis uh, as places of worship. No, uh, that is 
doesn't explain all of them. Um, but uh, it's, it's an interesting problem. I don't think there's maybe one specific answer to it, but um, it struck me going through these churches where you have window openings that are like this big, and then you have one little oculus um, open, allowing light in, so that what we read as a window on the exterior reads as something very, very different from what is actually opening to allow light in the building. Uh, can we end with the question uh, that uh, it's about the dog tooth decoration okay. uh, uh -huh. in architecture? Um, is there a structural role uh, of the bricks uh, comparing to the decorative role uh, in uh, Greek Byzantine architecture? Um. And I have to say that Quite a few years back, uh, Danny Churches uh, uh, gave a lecture here where he focused on uh, that decoration. Ah, okay. <laughs> yes, he wanted to see this as representing divine light or something exactly. of this sort. It's um, interesting that often I, I see it as kind of decorative bands mm. enlivening the wall of the building. Um, and in Greek architecture, you can see it in various places. And, um, the Panagia Church at Hosea Lucas is band after band after band, and then it goes up, up and around the windows. And it's very distinctive in the use here. In Constantinople, when you see dog tooth, it's only at the top of the wall. When the wall is finished, there will be a row, a dog tooth cornice that mark the line of the roof, and that's it. So it, has a, it appears very differently. Sometimes in Greek architecture, when you see the band of dog tooth, there will be a wooden reinforcement beam in the thickness of the wall behind it. But I see it as something that is primarily decorative. Um, I think uh, we should get you off the hook uh, and uh, <laughs> uh, say good night or, or bye bye to the people who are online. For those of us who are here, we will have a chance to convene in the garden uh, with a glass of wine and uh, congratulate Bob Osterhout for a wonderful talk that opened new vistas about Byzantine architecture. Thank you very much. Thank you, Maria.